It's very weird for me, for example, sitting playing that track to you, because all I've seen is you on the screen for the last two years, and suddenly seeing you there, that piece is going over your head as you're walking off into the distance. Yet for me, picturing Wallace at the same time, all of those different elements coming together, because it's not just about the music, it's about the amazing camera work, it's about the story, so it's all those elements you can't override the emotional loss of the time because you're distracting from the voiceover but that was one of the few moments when the producer and the director had just said look go for it this is such a massive moment this is a really important emotional climax of the piece now the clip that's that's labeled as endless momentum what is that and what's it for endless momentum is for episode 10 uh it's very strange writing music for history scotland for these last episodes because it's all getting a little bit tight in the filming schedule as you know so writing the music for it, I didn't actually get to see an awful lot of the visuals before we actually went away and recorded the orchestra. So I was told roughly what was going to be happening in episode 10 to do with the industrial kind of side of things, to do with the 20th century, to do with Raven's Craig, to do with lots of steel works. And I then had to go away and write some nice long tracks which could be chopped up afterwards because I had to get down to the recording sessions to actually get all the music recorded for when they're laying it in for the dub. But your uh, instructions were, as, were truly as vague as that. There's going to be steel work. It, was, it, it, it was pretty vague. We had to come up with some nice rhythm, some nice motion. We knew that the visuals of the library footage that was going to be used, we knew there was going to be lots of industrial footage going on. So it needed to have some kind of industrial elements and similarly needed to have lots of momentum going on it. alone composing how close can you get to the finished orchestral sound how big a surprise is it for you to be in the presence of the full orchestra when it's doing its thing surprise is the wrong word it's not a surprise because I can picture exactly how it's going to sound um, I think technology has come on to such an extent and it's had to to enable me to show producers and directors how the actual track will sound so it's not just sounding like that on the piano so I will do what we call an orchestral mock-up which is where I will play the stuff on the piano and then for example those strings there that you've just heard I would then play on synthesizers and different samples that I've got I mean I've got about a hundred thousand pounds worth of sample libraries around here so it's all the stuff that the Hollywood guys use but you still can't make it sound like an orchestra and to be honest even if you spent four months of your life trying to make it sound like that, it's never going to have the subtle nuances that you can have with real musicians. So in other soundtracks that I do, for example, Spooks, there isn't a budget to actually have live musicians. If you can get one live violin, you're doing really well and you've managed to be very nice to the producer. Whereas in something like History of Scotland, the point of having all the samples is just to mock it up to give them an idea. And then obviously when we get to the final orchestra recordings, then that's where the magic happens. You mention Spooks and I suppose a series whose aspirations are more different from those of A History of Scotland, it'd be hard to imagine. You know, how do you come off of A History of Scotland or whatever and then contemplate uh, giving a musical identity to spies and espionage and car chases? And There was only one cue in The History of Scotland where Richard, the producer, turned around and said, do you know what, it's great, but I think you should use it on spooks. So <laughs> it's not quite working for this battle sequence. Um, it's, it's actually not as hard as it sounds. So long as you can focus yourself, you can't do, say, an afternoon on Spooks and a morning on History of Scotland. You have to set aside time to do each episode because as you're getting into the flow of things, to be honest, I don't really speak to that many people while I'm actually composing because I like to really get caught up. And you hear about actors, the method acting, they call it, and I've nothing like that, but you do hear about them really getting into their parts. And with composing, for me, I just like to really probably do four or five days and nights non-stop sleeping hardly at all and just really getting into it and then have some sleep at the end of it and then have a look at what I've done and sort of go back and tweak it from there. So can you let me hear uh, an example of Spook's music that would illustrate the, the, the difference in the approach that you took to that sure. story? So I mean this is a stereotypical cue from Spook's. There's a car chase going on, the car's just about to explode. You've probably got about 20, 25 seconds of really high octane chase music going on. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's not so subtle. Sometimes there's strings, sometimes there's not strings. In this particular cue, I think up in flames, there's just an awful lot of drums going on. So you've just got to picture the action of cars flying off the road after each other. <laughs> Thank you. 
and that's the car gone off the road there. So when having done as much of this as you have now, when someone says to you car chase, does that instantly you're thinking of specific musical instruments, or if they say, you know, aerial view of the Sahara, are you thinking, well, that will be those instruments? Does it does it break down like that? Well, again, sometimes they want something that's very stereotypical. So, for example, in Spooks, the car chases do tend to be like that. But then you think, well. Do you know what, I want to try something different. I mean, people are used to car chases being like that. So then you might try doing something in real slow motion. Instead of having tons of drums, there might be like a pad and a really just gentle piano or a weird Rhodes keyboard or reverse sounds. And I think for me, the challenge as a composer is to come up with stuff which you're not expecting. So if a director says, I really need some high energy here, when you go back and say, do you know what? I can do you a high energy one if you want, but I think you should take a listen to this first. And when they turn around and go, my God, that's amazing. That I wouldn't have expected doing that at all. That's where the challenge as a composer is, to try and do something different and make them realise that every single chase scene or every single emotional scene doesn't have to be exactly the same. So tell me how uh, you progressed from being uh, a musician and a composer into also doing this kind of crossover work, providing the music for films, for television. Well, I studied music, I suppose film music in general, at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. And while I was there, I got approached to do some TV themes, some very kind of bizarre things where you do kind of little 30 second pieces of music for the starts of the show. But while I was there, I started getting quite busy. And so I rented out a room at the back of the main studios in Glasgow, which were called Savas Studios. And while I had these studios there, I got to work with quite a lot of bands like Ben Sebastian, Snow Patrol, um, Simple Minds, and some Texas as well. And I think the bands liked the fact that my style was quite, I used a lot of strings, it was quite cinematic. So the bands liked that, so they would come along and say, well, we want some strings on our album, can you help us out? So yeah, of course, not a problem. And then film directors really liked the fact that I was working with bands. It's, it, I suppose it gives you an edge, you know, it's something a little different, and film directors always look for something different. It sounds as though uh, film and TV chooses you rather than you choosing it. That's you were doing interesting music, and like a magpie the industry comes and sees it, something sparkly, rather than you going to it. So what, that's a really interesting... I've never really thought about it like that. Yeah, I suppose so, because, again, my style, I wasn't writing specifically to try and have music on film to begin with. It was just the fact that some people phoned up and said, I really like your stuff. Do you want to try your hand at this? And you kind of think, OK, that's great. And the fact that my, my style is quite cinematic, the fact that I like working with real strings and so on, I suppose, yeah, it's just they've got a nice kind of synergy with each other. I see.